What else do we learn? Unity. The importance of unity, brothers and sisters. I want, we learned it from the Salah. I, I shared the, the lesson from the Salah perspective. But I want to share it with you now from the Dar al arqam perspective. They came together, unity, to be united. Unity is important, brothers and sisters. It's unity that keeps us strong together. It's this unity that makes us vulnerable. You know, when I was a young boy, my father taught me unity very beautifully. And I discussed it on a short reminder online. In Africa, we have, we, we call it braise. You guys call it barbecue. You guys call it barbecue, huh? We have braise. Same thing, just different terminologies. To start up, you need twigs, right? Fire starters, twigs. And I was a small boy and I remember he said, go and get these twigs, go and pick up twigs from under the tree. You know, little boy, you're happy, it's exciting, it's Sunday, you're out, you're doing something with your dad. I'm come on, you call, huh? You're happy, I go, I'm picking up these twigs, I'm coming. So my dad would say, break this, I'll break it. Broken. Okay, go get some more, get some more. Now there's a bunch, he gives it to me. The bunch together, he says, break it. I'm trying, my little hands trying, can't break it. You can't break it, try harder. But you broke the other one, come on, try. Trying, I can't. He goes, okay, give it to me. Takes them back, takes one out, gives me that, now break this one, broken. So as you see, you see, he was trying to teach me from a young age. I have two sisters, he was trying to teach me that you must be together with your sisters, be united. Just give me a, the, a lesson for the home. Jazakallah khair, Hafidhullah is still alive, mashallah. So I'm to say, if you be together, no one will break you. How this sticks together, no one could break it. We couldn't break it. But the moment we took one out of the pack, broken. Another one, broken. Another one, broken. But the same sticks together, you couldn't break it. Wallahi, I remember this lesson whenever I discuss unity. Remember it, Wallahi, I remember it. And what a beautiful lesson it is. So we learn this, brothers and sisters. With that, we come to the next incident in the seerah, and this is the last incident for the series. And this is the Hijrah to Habasha. Hijrah to Habasha. Very quickly, brothers and sisters. Muslims were being persecuted. Pressure was mounting on Abu Talib, and now in an even greater way. And Rasulullah was becoming affected by the persecution upon the Muslims, by his uncle being pressured. Something had to happen. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, inspired by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of course, directed the Muslims to go to Habasha. And he said that in Habasha, there is a just king, and Habasha will be an abode for you until Allah opens away. So what happened? Uthman ibn Affan, his wife Ruqayya bint Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Abdurrahman ibn Auf, Utbah ibn Rabi'ah, and his wife, Sahla bin uh, bint uh, Suhail, Az Zubair ibn Al Awam, Musab ibn Umair, Abu Salama ibn Abd Al Asad, and his wife Um Salama bint Abi Umayyah, Uthman ibn Madhoun, Amir ibn Rabi'a, and his wife Layla. This group left Mecca, heading towards Jeddah or Judda. And they got to a place which the scholars today say is around 70 kilometers south of Jeddah or Judah. And here it so happened that Allah made the setting that two ships came in for trade. So they boarded these ships and went. How did they go to South Jeddah or Judah? Some walked and some rode. Now we know when we land at the airport and the drive to Makkah, it's not, a, it's, it's, it's not a short drive. 45 minutes, one hour, depending on traffic. 120 kilometers, wide roads, air-conditioned vehicles, big Camry, spacious, right? <laughs> Imagine that, desert, hills, not flattened roads, mountains. This journey was no small journey, but they had to do it. They did it. And... They went to Habasha. When did this happen? Also in which year? The fifth year after? Nubuwa. Well done. After Nubuwa. After prophethood. So they went. And they found safe haven 
and were free from persecution and they developed their worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and their brotherhood and sisterhood and belief and so on and so forth and they didn't stay too long it lasted a few months and they returned now there's a story which mentions why they returned but the story is heavily disputed amongst the scholars and for us to sit and discuss that story its authenticity or if it's authentic how we should understand it and so on and so forth it will take us away um, from the endeavors of this class so i'll leave it out for at this particular sitting as i said this is not dedicated towards going through the seerah word for word we want to take the incidents and take lessons from the incidents right so there's there is an incident that the scholars of hadith and the historians discuss heavily and they say this incident was the incident why they left habash and went back to mecca ala kulli hal for our class they didn't last long in habasha and they returned now this move happened in stealth mode meaning when they left the people of Mecca didn't know that this there's mass movement here meaning there's movement it wasn't mass it was a few people as you've seen I cited for you the names that these people have moved but it so happened that the persecution was carrying on and carrying on and carrying on that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam had to command them again to go to Habasha once again Hijra number two this time though 83 men and 18 females attempted the journey much larger group caught the eyes of the Quraysh that these people are leaving where are they going let's find out send the intelligence <laughs> right let's find out so they found out now the Quraysh were on a mission right they wanted to eradicate Islam they weren't going to leave people to go and settle somewhere else for Islam to grow and come back stronger so what did they do they responded what was the response the Quraysh said we will send the best from us who was the best you know obviously propaganda has to spread this we are spreading it here we need to send the best to spread it there so the king kicks them out, right? And we're going to send our best and not only send them, we're going to send them with mighty gifts for Najashi, the king of Habasha. We're going to send him mighty gifts. So who did they send? Amr ibn Las and Abdullah ibn Abi Rabi'ah. Amr ibn Las, he had a mighty mind, very intelligent. These two, just two people, imagine. In, in wake of a hundred people going, you got just two people going to do what? The purpose of doing what? Spreading propaganda. And we discussed propaganda in detail. So they went and they went with their gifts and they went to Najashi and they gave him the gifts and they spoke a beautiful speech. But it didn't work. Why? What did Rasulullah say about Najashi? He was what? A just king. What does a just person do? Thank you for coming with your gifts. I've heard what you've had to say. Hold on a second, let's call them and give them a chance to speak. That's what just people do. Not you listen to one side and then you start giving advice. No. You start creating reactions to what's been heard. No. Find out what's on the other side. There's two sides to every story. So, the Muslims were told, listen, you're being called in by the authority of the land. So now the Muslims had a meeting. Listen, we need a speaker. Who's going to speak? We need someone to speak. So they discussed, discussed, discussed. Mashwara wa amruhum shura. Right? They, they, they had mashwara and a discussion and deliberation. And they agreed that, you know what? Ja'far ibn Abi Talib. He should be the speaker. So they went. And Ja'far uh, went ahead and spoke. What did Ja'far say? Obviously, Najashi asked, uh, asked the Muslims, we have these representatives, this is what they've said, what do you have to say? Ja'far spoke an amazing word. Ja'far said, we were a people in Jahiliyyah, in ignorance, we used to worship idols, and we used to eat the meat of dead animals, and we used to be immoral people, involved in adultery and so on and so forth. And we used to break the bond of kinship and we used to disrespect our neighbor and the strong from amongst us used to eat the weak the rich from amongst us used to oppress the poor this is who we were this is what Jafar said 
right? And then he spoke about what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came with. This is what Ja'far did. All right. That's what happened. What are the lessons? We need the lessons. What lessons do we learn? Firstly, number one, there's two sides to every story. Najashi taught us this. And he became a Muslim, Najashi. He taught us this. Okay. What's the next lesson? Never be hasty. <coughs> Never act in, in haste. Don't rush. Who taught us this? Najashi. He also taught us this. Intelligent people lived a long time ago, brothers and sisters. Intelligent people. Never be in haste. No, none of this knee-jerk reaction. You know what a knee-jerk reaction is? It's this... You, you know, when, if you knock your knee at a certain spot, it reacts. It just, without you knowing it, it moves, right? Hmm? S some people have this. Something happens immediately. Reaction, 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 reaction. Take a deep breath. Get your heartbeat back to normal. Right? Right? Get the blood pressure to come down. Right? You need to do all these things. Then think. You know, my dad used to always tell me, you know what, don't answer. Answer tomorrow. Even in normal circumstances, answer tomorrow. Someone, you know, gives you a proposition. Answer tomorrow. What are you going to lose? Nothing. And especially when a situation causes you to become claustrophobic, even that is, you, then you really must answer tomorrow. <laughs> don't answer now. Because you answer something you'll regret. It happens. It happens. Many of times, we act in haste. We write an email, we send it. No, read it again. Maybe you were too hard. You said some things you shouldn't have said. You read it a second time, you start editing it, change it here, change it there. This is a bit too harsh. But why? Because when, by the time you finish writing, you calm down a little bit. Now you're reading again, you're reading with a different emotion. When you read it the second time, you calm down again. Right? When you read it again, you're going to say, Ah, no, I shouldn't have said this, I shouldn't have said this. Wallah, sahih. And for those who don't like spelling mistakes, when do we see more spelling mistakes? When people just write emails and send it without checking. <laughs> Full of punctuation mistakes, spelling mistakes, and so on and so forth. So never be haste. Number three, never lose your values. How many times have we learned this in the seerah? Who taught us this? Najashi. They came with gifts. But did he get pressured? No. My value is I must listen to them. I have to listen to the other side. Yes, you brought me gifts, but does this mean you brought me gifts, I'm just going to now khalas. You gave me gifts, so I'm just going to listen to you? No. My way is I have to listen to the other side. And he did. And that's why they were supported. He made his decision. It wasn't because if he didn't, the gifts was, it's not a gift. It becomes what? Bribery. It becomes bribery. I'm a man of, I have values. I don't accept bribery and corruption. Right? So, no, these are gifts, they're gifts. What we're dealing with is something else. There's a due process. So we learned that third lesson, never lose your values. Number four, what do we learn? If you live in a land that does not allow you to say La ilaha illallah or, or, or what La ilaha illallah necessitates, migrate, migrate. Allah's earth is vast. Migrate. And the fifth lesson comes in that we can seek safe haven in non-Muslim lands, if need be. We seek safe haven in non-Muslim lands if need be. If your land is persecuting you, you go to a non-Muslim land. The main thing is they allow you to worship Allah. If they don't, move somewhere else. We learn the permissibility of being able to do so. Rasulullah said, go to Najashi. Was Najashi a Muslim then? No. He was a Christian, look, right? This is what we tell. We say, look, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sent the Muslims to the Christians. Say, go and live under them. They will look after you. They're people of system and values. They have justice. And that's why I remember that lesson when I told you, be grateful. We live as Muslim minorities in Australia, in the UK, in Canada, in America. What did I say? Be grateful. I know. In terms of the country's system, it's your right that you can pray salah and so on and so forth. So we say there's nothing to be thankful for. That's the democratic society. I say that's fine. 
but the Islamic system is that you be, you be thankful. They don't owe you favors for being a Muslim, do they? You be thankful. Thank them. What are you going to lose? you showing the Islamic character. There's that way. I'm not saying thank them for show. Sincerely thank them. Who knows what Allah will put in your action? Actions speak louder than words. What da'wah are you giving? Brothers and sisters in the universities, RMIT, all these messages. I gave a lecture once in RMIT. Beautiful place for salah. University of Melbourne, mashallah. Place for them to pray salah, not so? Right? So now, thank the authorities. Write to the rector. All the Muslims gathered the signatures. A letter of heartfelt gratitude for giving us, allowing us the opportunity. Did they have to? Did they have to? Was, it, was that necessary to you being educated? No. It was courtesy. That they said, you have these beliefs? Okay. Here's a room, use it. Write a letter of thanks. May Allah grant us the understanding. Ameen. Ameen. Brothers and sisters, we also learn a lesson. And that's from the way Ja'far spoke. When Najashi asked, about what the two visitors said. What did Ja'far say? Ja'far said, we were a people who used to do this, 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 this. Good things or bad things? Bad things. He said the bad things before he mentioned what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught, which was the good things. You know what the scholars deduce from this? This is a, this is a principle. And we need this in Ramadan and any, even during different times people say, what is better for me to do? Should I say, Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah and increase it? Or should I say, Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah, Istighfar removes sins, right? Alhamdulillah, Subhanallah brings rewards. Which should I do first? We say to clean the mess happens before you perfume the surface. If the, if the floor is still messed and you come with your brilliant perfume and you pour it on top, it's still going to be messy, right? <clears throat> it's still going to be? It's still going to be messy. Clean the floor first. When you've, rid, when, you've, when you've removed the impurities, now put the perfume. It's going to smell nice. The effect of the perfume will be felt. It won't be polluted by the negative nature of the filth and impurity. Same way, sins are impure. Remove the sin with istighfar. Remove the sins before you polish the surface. Subhanallah, alhamdulillah, wa la ilaha illallah, wallahu akbar, wa la hawla, wa la quwwata illa billahi al-ali al-azim. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi, subhanallah al-azim. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi, adada khalqi, wa rida nafsi, wa zinata arshi, wa midada kalimati. Right? Before you polish, clean the surface. How? Through istighfar. They, they deduced this from Ja'far's speech. How amazing this, wallahi. Istanbatu hadha min kalam Ja'far. Annahu qaddam al-mahathir. Or qaddam al-sayyiat. He said, nahnu kunna wa kunna wa kunna wa kunna wa kunna wa kunna. We used to do all these sins. He mentioned the sins before saying what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came with. So he mentioned all the dead. Because now Rasulullah removed this debt and he came with this goodness. So they teach us that. And, and, and even in the Quran, this message is true, even in the Quran, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his book, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, says, فَمَنْ يَكْفُرْ بِالطَّاغُوتِ وَيُؤْمِنْ بِاللَّهِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us first to disbelieve in there being other gods worthy of worship besides Allah, and then believe that there's no one worthy of worship besides one Allah. Disbelieve in all the other gods besides Allah, and then believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only being the only God worthy of worship. Clean the surface first, then polish it. You have to deny there being other gods worthy of worship besides Allah. When you've denied that there's nothing else worthy of worship besides Allah, now you say La ilaha illallah and announce your belief that there's only one, there's no one worthy of worship besides one Allah. So these are, 
this is, uh, these are nuances, right? These are very unique lessons that we're just pulling out with subhanAllah. And this I read from the work of the scholars. I said, La ilaha illallah. Rabbi zidni ilma. Wallahi. These scholars, wallahi, what Allah gave them was ajib. Was ajib. Tayyib. The last thing I'm going to say, brothers and sisters, and we'll end our series, uh, or this first part of the series on, and it's worth saying, is reinforcing what we've said many a time. And that is, the first da'wah you do is what? Tawheed. You call to the oneness of Allah. Because Ja'far spoke about the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala during his amazing speech in front of the king Dajash. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. We've learned tens of lessons, if not hundreds, brothers and sisters. We've spent hours together, alhamdulillah. We've shared thousands of words with one another and listened to thousands of sentences. It's been an absolute honor being with you all here this Ramadan in Melbourne, Australia, 2014, to kick off this series, A Blast from the Past, here in the 21st century. Inshallah, we're going to have a continuation of the series whenever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala permits. We'll have the same name, inshallah, but we'll just call it part two and then part three and then part four, inshallah. Right? But alhamdulillah, you are the founding, the founding attendees, alhamdulillah, uh, of this particular series. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to put great barakah in it. It's been an absolute pleasure, wallahi. And I thank you all for allowing me to be a guest in your home. And I pray that I've been a worthy guest. And to my brothers and sisters on the other side of that camera, I also thank you for allowing me to be a guest in your home. And I pray that I was a worthy guest as well. And I pray that you allow me to be a guest again. It's always a pleasure coming to Melbourne, wallahi. It's always a pleasure coming to Melbourne. And I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decrees many a visit. I pray that you remember my speech to you after Salat al Isha about the blessing of having premises like these so that we can sit together in these premises and learn from the inheritance left behind by Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wallahi, when, I, when we started episode one, I never thought the last episode would come this fast. Episode number 16. Alhamdulillah bi ni'mati tatim salihat All praises belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for it is with Allah's blessings that goodness becomes completed. Brothers and sisters, whatever I shared, I shared from my heart. And if it worked for you, share it with others. Spread the goodness and spread the khair. And help my rewards increase. Brothers and sisters, Allah blessed us to spend almost three weeks with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And my brothers and sisters, as I said to you yesterday, and I'm going to say to you again, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will not come back here. He's passed away. But it's for you to ask yourself a question. That if he was to come and knock our door today, how ready are we to invite him into our home? If he was to visit our Muslim organization today, how ready are we to open our door for him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? If he was to visit our Islamic school today, how ready are we to open our door for him? I tell this to my team as well. al kothar if he was to visit an al kothar course today, how ready are we to open the door for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Is it, can it be something that we will be so excited, open the door and welcome him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Or will it be subhanallah? Excuse ourselves for a few minutes whilst we sort things out inside. You know, ch maybe chuck the TV out the window quickly if the window's big enough. Because now the TVs are so big, subhanAllah. Right? Who knows? Might have to sort out things, you know, throw those magazines under the sofa. Change the ringtones on our mobile phones. Make sure, you know, the Makkah channel is on in case the TV switches on somehow. At least Makkah channel comes on. No, it's this. we have to ask ourselves. This is what we have to ask ourselves. I want us to, to, to I want, this is how I want to end this, brothers and sisters. We've spent two and a half weeks in the company of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. But wallahi, sunnah is with us every day. It's with us every day. 
whether we apply it or not, this is what we have to realize. If he was to visit us here today, how ready are we to receive the messenger of Allah, Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the man who loved you and I, before we could love him. Wallahi, before we could love him. Before we were born, he loved us. I told you, he said to his companions, I miss my brothers. I miss my brothers. The Sahaba said, we are your brothers. Who are you missing? We're with you. He said, you are my companions. You are my companions. My brothers are those who will come. Wallahi, they wouldn't have seen me, nor this Quran being revealed. But they will believe in every word that I said and this message that Allah has revealed. Those are my brothers. I miss my brothers. Wallahi, he loved us before we loved him. How ready are we to receive Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? There's a big massive sign at the back of the masjid, the sunnah, the better. Where is the sunnah in our lives? Where is the sunnah? We've seen, wallahi, we've deduced things probably, subhanallah, Allah has opened upon this gathering lessons in the 21st century. From the time when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was in the womb of his mother, Allahu Akbar. Before he was even born, when did we start? We started with the we started with the of the elephants. The sunnah, the better. Brothers and sisters, today we are people who leave things because it's sunnah. The greatest people who walked the face of this earth, they did things because it was sunnah. Because Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did it. Because he did it sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It wasn't, it's only sunnah, it's khalas, don't worry about it. You know? No. Because he did it, they did it. And they were great because of it. You want greatness to come to this ummah? You want the situation to change? You need a lot more than boycotting products from a certain country by Allah. You need a lot more than that. You need a lot more than that. At takhliya qabla tahliya. You got to remove the filth, brothers and sisters. Yes, boycotting the products is good. Inshallah, it works. But you got to boycott the bid'ah. And you got to boycott that which is khilaf as sunnah, that which is against the sunnah. You got to boycott it as well. You got to boycott backbiting. You got to boycott disrespecting your parents. You got to boycott abandoning your children. Letting other people bring them up as if you can outsource parenting. Subhanallah. You got to abandon bad character. You got to abandon shaitan. You got to abandon being a slave of your desires. There's massive things that need boycotting, brothers and sisters. Don't get caught up. In the, in the commotion that you've lost sight of the priorities. Don't be those people. Don't be those people. This is, this is what I want to close the series on. I want to close it on these words of inshallah wisdom and words of thought. Everything correct said is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and He's perfect in any mistake or mistakes and there were mistakes are from myself or indeed I'm weak and shaitan. And I seek Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's forgiveness. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decree upon us to drink from the hands of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on the day of Qiyamah. That we can't wait to see him, thus we see him. And nobody takes us away from him. That we died as people upon his way, upon his character, upon his message. May Allah decree upon us to be from amongst those that will enjoy the intercession of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ameen. May Allah make us people that live the sunnah, revive the sunnah, support the sunnah, preach the sunnah, spread the sunnah, tear because of the sunnah, happy tears, painful tears when we see bid'ah, we cry painful tears because of the sunnah being disrespected and happy tears when we see the revival of the sunnah. May Allah make us these people. Ameen. May Allah grant us death whilst he's pleased with us. Grant us shade underneath his arsh on the day of Qiyamah. Grant us our book of deeds in our right hands. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept this Ramadan and make it the best Ramadan we ever experienced. 
May Allah make us those who have witnessed the night of power. May Allah make us from amongst those freed from the hellfire. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from the muttaqun, and najihun the successful people of taqwa with the passing of this month. Ameen. Allahumma a'id alayna shahra ramadhan a'waman adida wa azminatan madida. May Allah cause the month of Ramadan to visit us for many, many years to come. وَنَحْنُ فِي صِحَّةٍ وَعَافِيَةٍ And we enjoy good health and amazing situations so that we can worship Allah again and again during these blessed months. Ameen. هَذَا وَاللَّهُ أَعْلَمْ I love you all for the sake of Allah. Wallahi, I do. Please forgive me if I didn't get around to answering any of your questions. If you wanted to see me and I walked away, Wallahi, it was not anticipated, it was not intended. Please forgive me, brothers and sisters. Please forgive me. And inshallah, I will leave details for you to contact me, bi'idhnillahi ta'ala. So for those that I missed, you can still contact, inshallah. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi, subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika. Nashadu an la ilaha illa ant. Nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Wa sallallahu wa sallama wa baraka ala nabiyyina Muhammad. Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Until next time, inshallah.